Last week was not a shining moment for the Catholic Church. Once again, the festering wound of covering up sexual abuse was reopened, this time with quite a bit of new information about the Church's most public fiasco, that of former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Rewind the clock 15 years, and the name Cardinal McCarrick is a force to be reckoned with for all the right reasons. At the time, he was the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., one of the most important sees in the country, having served as a bishop since 1977 and a cardinal since 2001. Although not known to be a serious theologian or spiritual leader, he was an incredible fundraiser, major advocate for peace and justice work, was a natural in front of the camera, able to put a positive face on the Catholic Church and the media, and well known for his diplomatic work abroad. In short, Cardinal McCarrick was the sort of guy you wanted to know and be associated with. Being on his good side meant that you were likely to rise up in the church. Unfortunately, this was not his entire story, as McCarrick lived a double life. In 2018, a church investigation found him guilty of sexually abusing seminarians and minors over many years, often inviting seminarians to his guest house and forcing them to sleep in his bed with him. He was ultimately laicized and has lived a private life since then. In and of itself, this is awful. The thought of a religious leader abusing a minor, of a bishop abusing his own seminarians, is just heinous. But this, regrettably, isn't even the worst part of the story. Because a story like this naturally raises an important question. How was a man like this, someone who abused people for many years, abused people in his own leadership structure, able to rise as high as he did? That was the question the church sought to answer after he was found guilty of these actions back in 2018, and what made last week yet another dark moment for the Catholic Church. After two years of investigation, the Vatican released a 450-page answer to that question, and it's not great. Apparently, question of his behavior was one of the worst-kept secrets in the church, with many priests talking openly about his seminary and sleepovers for years. Lay people and religious women brought these rumors to the surface with formal allegations, and one priest, worried about the possibility of public scandal, even advised John Paul II not to visit McCarrick on his U.S. trip or to make him a cardinal. These warnings were repeatedly dismissed, however, as other bishops offered contradictory reports of McCarrick coming to his defense and suggesting that those making allegations were just looking for attention. The report also shows that the Vatican instructed then-Papal Nuncio Carlo Vigano to investigate claims further, but that he failed to do so, undermining Vigano's own attacks against Popes Benedict and Francis as unfounded. All told, the report does not place the blame on any one person or give a clear reason as to how this was able to happen. Like so much social sin, the culpability is spread far and wide, with misinformation and cover-ups making it nearly impossible for any one person to have prevented it. Despite various allegations, everyone seemed to have given him the benefit of the doubt because others had before them. Truly, just a horrible situation. One that exposes so much of what was and still is wrong with our hierarchical structure, a web of secrecy and clericalism that has shown itself, time and again, more concerned with public scandal than with truth. After the report came out last week, I sat with it for days, just asking myself, how is this possible? How do I make sense of any of this? How the heck am I going to face people on Sunday and have anything meaningful to say? Given the nature of the issue that was the direct result of secrecy and cover-ups, I knew that I couldn't just let it slip through the news cycle, just hope that it would go away. I had to address it with our congregation, and as Providence would have it, the gospel this week was perfect. The parable of the talents. Now, for many people, the message of this parable is pretty clear. The point that Jesus is making is that God gives us gifts, and it's up to us to use them, to multiply them even for God. The one who squanders or buries their gift displeases God and will not enter the kingdom of heaven. For the vast majority of people, it is a parable about stewardship. And that's true, to some extent. That is definitely a valid and important way to read the text, and it should be a reminder to us all that we owe everything to God. But I don't think that it's the only thing that we can get from this text. You see, for some reason, we all make the assumption that the king mentioned in the parable represents God. This is often the case in Jesus' parables, and reading it in this way makes a lot of sense on the surface, but it never explicitly says so. 
Given the fact that Matthew's gospel continuously portrays earthly kings in contrast with the true kingship of Jesus, there is reason for suspicion here, and a careful look at how the king is described gives good reason to think otherwise. Here is an extremely wealthy man, excessively wealthy, one might say. He goes on a trip, leaving with his servants eight talents, a measure of money that means little to us today, but was actually enormous. In the ancient world, a talent was worth roughly 15 years of day wages. Translating for minimum wage in the US today, we're talking about $1.8 million casually left with his servants. But of course, they were not given this wealth with the mere purpose of protecting it, as the king's anger with the third servant shows. He wanted to double his profits. He wanted to make millions of dollars for doing no work at all. How could the servants accomplish such a task in the ancient world? By buying and trading goods, by lending money with interest, by seizing the property of delinquent debts. Given the description of the king by the third servant, I'm guessing anything was on the table here. Remember what he says, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. Think about that harvesting where you did not plant, gathering where you did not scatter. That's called stealing. It's called being so rich and powerful that you can take from other people's labors and they can't do anything about it. With this in mind, the third servant does not seem so repugnant or afraid, but rather quite heroic. He buries the money in the ground because he wants nothing to do with the master's business. He stands up to the master and calls him out for his injustice. He stands out against the rest and is willing to accept the consequences for opting out. And there are consequences. He's called wicked and lazy, has his money taken from him, is cast out into the darkness, allowing the loyal servants to benefit greater. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Does this king sound anything like the God we believe in? Does this sound anything like the Beatitudes or the works of mercy or servant leadership? If this is the way the king operates, I'm not sure we're supposed to be like the first two servants. Rather, maybe more like the third, the one choosing to not take part in the evil doings of others, who is willing to suffer rather than perpetuate it ourselves. And look, maybe there were justifications. If this king in the parable was truly like this, I imagine that the first two servants had a lot of fear standing up to him. Look what happened to the third guy. I imagine that they were worried about losing their jobs, providing for their families. Maybe they used the money they earned for their communities and did great work otherwise. In their minds, far worse evil would have been done had they stood up to the master, and so they justified being complicit. For me though, this parable is less about stewardship in a narrow sense and much more about loyalty in a broader sense. For me, the line, come, share your master's joy, says it all. What I think Jesus is trying to get us to understand about the kingdom is that our ultimate reward will be paid by the one we serve, by the one to whom we give our loyalty. If you read the king in this story to be God's, it makes sense. Serve God with your whole heart, be a good and faithful servant to God, risking everything to make God a prophet, and you will share the master's joy in heaven. But even if you read the king in this story to be an evil king, a mob boss, a slum landlord, a corrupt politician, the same truth is revealed. Serve those who are evil, do their bidding, be loyal to their wishes, and you will share in that master's joy. Jesus is once again telling his people that you can only have one master. You can only give your ultimate loyalty to one person. To whom will you be loyal? By whom will you be rewarded? Serving corrupt earthly kings will definitely bring a reward as seen in the complicity of the first two servants, but maybe that's not the reward you should want. Maybe it would be better to stand up to those kings, to suffer for a while, and to be rewarded by the true king in heaven. It's in reading the passage this way that I return to our present day situation with a bit more clarity on what went wrong in our church. Theodore McCarrick was able to rise the ranks as he did because he was seen to be indispensable to those around him, because he was able to find servants seeking a reward from him. He was an incredible fundraiser, powerful advocate, media darling, and talented diplomat. Anyone willing to serve him, meaning cover for him, dismiss allegations, overlook red flags, give him the benefit of the doubt, these people would benefit. More money, higher positions, greater prominence. They shared in the master's joy. 
Unfortunately, though, it wasn't the right master. Unfortunately, there were far more people like the first and second servant willing to benefit from him than there were people like the third servant willing to stand up to him. Just like the servants in the parables, there might have been good justifications in their minds. They saw the great work of social justice. They were concerned about public scandal. They worried about losing their job and all the work that they were doing. Was it really worth bringing it up and losing all of that? Many, many people said no, and so remained silent, benefiting from a man's evil. I know that the situation is complicated and can't be boiled down to a simple answer, but I have to believe that this is the main crux of it. Too many people, for far too long, served the wrong master. They shared the master's joy, and now we are all sharing that master's suffering. But it's not all bad. I don't come to you today simply to pile on the tragedy of our church or to criticize it further. I make this video to make sure that the truth is brought to light, that we address this issue, yes, but also to point out that there is reason for hope in all of this. If we can allow it, we can learn from this situation and grow from it. For starters, it reminds us that we are, at least in part, a human institution, susceptible to the evils of humanity and not impervious to corruption or criticism. Being a deacon, priest, or bishop is not enough to shield one from the temptations of evil, and so if we are to be a healthy church, our clerical orders must be transparent with, and dare I say, even led by lay people from time to time. Secrecy is not the answer. The All Boys Club isn't working, and our church is at its best when it is diverse and open, allowing women, the Global South, and lay people in general to have leadership opportunities. What it shows me is that we have a Pope who is willing to take the steps to get there. Not only has he continually looked outside of the norm to fill high-ranking positions, he has made the finances of the Vatican far more transparent in recent years. And let's not forget, we have this report. As awful as it is, every previous Pope would have kept it entirely silent. The fact that he is open about our failings gives me hope that we can have honest dialogue about our solutions. And finally, and definitely most important of all, we must remind ourselves that we are not purely a human institution, but a divine institution as well. Jesus founded this church. The Holy Spirit guides it. We are not like the governments or social institutions of the world. We may have men and women making the day-to-day -day decisions, but the ultimate path we take, the end we achieve, is not the result of our doing, but of God's. Looking at situations like this has led many people to leave the church in disgust, unable to be a part of something as corrupt as it is. And I understand that. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't give up on Christ because of the sins of Peter. Flawed men and women will always be a part of the church, smearing its name. But the church as a whole, in its foundation, life, and mission, is holy because Christ is holy. I remain a part of this church, not because I support Theodore McCarrick, not because I think that the church has always done well, not because I think that they're handling this situation well, but because it is the church that Christ founded and inspires. It is the one where I find Christ in all that I do, guiding me and filling me with his Holy Spirit. I know that many of you watching are deeply troubled by the newest revelations, and so I just want to say to you, so am I. It saddens me to see people serving the wrong master, and it calls me to ask the question myself, whom do I serve? I pray that all of us, those who love Christ, those who love the church he founded, will never serve any other master but him, and that together, one day, we may all share in the true master's joy.